My soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be greatly shaken. Please pray with me. Father God, I thank you and praise you that you are our rock and our salvation and that we can come to you at any time with anything. And so this morning, Lord, we want to turn our hearts towards you. And Lord, we want to pray that you would enable us to meet with you, to meet with your spirit. God, we know your presence is with us, but Lord, we pray that you would work in a way that you haven't before in our lives. God, that you would work through Pastor James, you would give him the words um, to speak that you want this body to hear, that you want to encourage and guide and um, lead us with, Lord. We thank you for the fact that when we gather together, two or three, that you are in our midst and you hear us, Lord. And so we pray, Lord, we lift up the Ajaberos, Lord, and we do pray for Emmanuel as he must travel a great distance is to get tests and, and um, get judged and looked at. Lord, we do pray for your favor in those things. We pray that you would be with him in that. And, Lord, that you would grant him the visa that he could come be with his family, see his son, Lord. God, we praise you that Susan uh, made it through. Susan Hoff made it through her surgery, that she's recovering. And we continue to pray, God, for healing mercies for her, that you would bring healing upon her and uh, make it speedy and quickly too, Lord, in accordance with your will. And Lord, we, we lift up, lift up um, Becca Badgett's mom, Lord. We, she had some complications. Uh, there's some confusion, not even sure of what may be going on, Lord, but you know. And so we entrust it to you, Lord, our rock and our salvation, Lord. We commit the rest of this service to you, Lord, and we open our hearts and our minds. Pray that you would speak into them. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. This morning I'll be reading from James chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. If you're going to use the Bible in front of you, it can be found on page uh, 654. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord, he is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers with the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Blessed is the man who is steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. The desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived much. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will he brought forth by the word of truth, that we should be kind of his first fruits of his creatures. At this time, children ages 4, 5, and 6 are dismissed for Children's Church. Thanks, Chris. Well, it's been a good morning. I, I trust it's been a good morning for you as well, and really, really excited that you're here. Really excited for a new series as well as we walk through James, and 
I know it's snowing again. I promise I will not reference that every week. But, but there's something profound about the imagery that the Bible uses for us. Very simple images, very simple illustrations. Right? So the Old Testament says, though your, your sins are like crimson, you will be whiter than snow. Like there's a reason that the, the language there is snow. Like this afternoon, go home, take your milk, whatever kind you have, unless it's almond, right? It's not milk. <laughs> That's a whole other conversation. Take your milk and go outside and set it in the snow. Don't leave it there, but look at the color. Like we, we see milk, it's, it's white. We use it every day in coffee and cereal and baking. But when you, you put it next to crisp, pure, beautiful, spotless, white snow, like it's falling right now, look at the color of your milk and then go drink a glass. It's like a yellowy tint. But there's something profound for us that the images that God uses all over the Bible for us are for our, our learning and our treasuring of him, right? Even, we're not even in the sermon yet. Um, like, as far, he removes our sin as far as the east is from the west. Why? Why not north and south? Or you go far enough north, you start going south. East and west never intersect. Like, there's something beautiful about the way God uses these images and illustrations for us to talk about forgiveness and mercy and our sin being removed. So I'm not thrilled that the snow is here, but it's a, a beautiful reminder for us of all that God has done for us and continues to do for us in the gospel. So it is a, a new series. Uh, it's called uh, Fruit of Faith. And what I want you to see over the next weeks leading up to Easter uh, is what does it look like? What is the fruit that, that's born in our lives when faith takes root in our hearts? Like the gospel moves in, sets up shop, everything about our lives begins to change. So what is the fruit that be, be, uh, becomes evident or evidences itself in our lives when that takes place? And one of the things that we'll see uh, over the next few weeks, it, it again, is this tension between law and gospel but, but also faith and works. Many reformers use this, this phrase. It's hard to attribute exactly who it's from, but it is our faith alone that justifies, right? So we are forgiven by God. We stand perfect before God because of our faith in what Jesus accomplished for us. So it is our faith alone that justifies, yet our faith, it is the faith that justifies that does not remain alone, right? So the fruit of that, the evidence of that, the work that comes because of that in our lives must be there as well. And we'll see moving forward what that, what that looks like. In 1985, <clears throat> the Getty Museum in Los Angeles bought a seven-foot marble sculpture. Pictures are there. The art dealer who was selling it said it was from the 6th century B.C., and so the, the Getty Museum spent anywhere between 10 and $12 million. I don't know that they want to publish that, but, but around $12 million. And then they spent 14 months testing it, putting it under x-rays, studying the surface of it, boring into it, and, and taking samples of the marble to, to prove whether or not it was authentic. I don't know why they did this after they purchased it. But they eventually came to the conclusion it's authentic, we'll put it on display. And after they did, then all the art critics became uh, available. They, they kind of flooded there, studied it. And within a matter of months, they realized through art critics and everybody that was studying it, this isn't real. This is a fake. Right? The fingernails uh, from that time didn't match up. The finish and the patina of this marble sculpture didn't line up with what it should look like. The, the, there was variations in style. And so you can go to the Getty Museum now and look at the little placard that stands in front of this. And it says, Greek, from 530 B.C. or a modern forgery. <laughs> Somebody probably lost their job. You spend $12 million only then to be maybe confronted with the reality that's, that's a fake. But this idea of testing, 
What, what, what's authentic? What's real? What does it look like? Is, is very true for us as well. And the, the book of James, like, like very few other books, does that for us. It holds up for us what our faith should look like. And these tests that come to, to demonstrate, do we believe this? If the gospel has taken root in our hearts, in our lives, is that what's being evidenced to a watching world? So in James 1, 1 to 19, which was read, I want you to see, I mean, there's this idea here over and over and over of, of standing. But I want you to see that our ability to stand, and not just stand, right? We can stand and endure things, but, but what's in this text as well is this idea of joy. So our ability to stand with great joy is founded on the, the provision and the promises of God, namely the gospel. And we'll see that in, as we kind of walk through the text this morning, that our ability to stand with great joy today, tomorrow, with whatever you're enduring, whatever you're facing, is based upon what God has done for us already and what God promises to bring to fruition and promises still to do for us. So verses 1 to 4, we can stand joyfully or we can joyfully stand in trials. So, this is a letter, and so James is writing, and so he begins with James, a servant of God, of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, James here is the brother of Jesus. We, we see that in Galatians 1, Galatians 2, 1 Corinthians 15, that this person that's writing this is, is the half-brother of Jesus. We get into Acts 15, and, and this man is, is one of the leaders, the founders of this Jerusalem council. So, a very prominent figure just because of his relationship to Christ and also the relationship to this New Testament church. Didn't come to faith uh, until later. So he grew up with Jesus and, and yet didn't have a profound impact moving him to faith until later. And so what's profound about this is that James has every reason to boast in the, the opening words here. And yet the very next phrase after his name is servant. James, brother of Jesus, leader in this, this, uh, this movement, this church, the council, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll come back to that in a little while. Eventually, James would be martyred in about the year 62. It's not sure exactly how. He's either thrown from one of the towers of the temple or was stoned. But he's writing here to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. In other words, he's writing to the true people of God, the church of God, scattered all over the world. Now, it's very similar to 1 Peter and lists all of these places that they're scattered, but basically scattered to the four corners of the earth that, that God will one day reunite, one day bring back together these people waiting for their homeland, waiting to go home. That's what the word dispersion means. They're, they're dispersed. They're scattered all over the place, waiting to go home. Like you and I, longing for heaven, everything that we're enduring, waiting, longing, yearning to go and be with God. But he says in verse 2, count it all joy. So in this morning's text, 1 to 19, there are seven different commands. This is one of them. Count it all joy. It's not suggestive. He doesn't say, if you get around to it, if you think it would be helpful, it may, you may want to consider it. No, no. Count it joy. Count it all joy when you meet these trials. This seems absurd, right? <laughs> this isn't our first response, right? Count it all joy when things are going well. Absolutely. No, count it all joy when you meet trials of various kinds. When, not if, not if you meet trials, when they come. Not just the good times, but when these trials of varying degrees, varying types, varying kinds come into your life, meet them with joy. They are suffering persecution for their faith. So these people of God scattered all over the Mediterranean world are living in places where it wasn't, Christianity wasn't illegal. But they likely faced ostracism, kind of a reduction in social class or social status. 
Because of that, they were marginalized, which meant most of them ended up facing poverty of certain degrees. As not legal citizens of those places, uh, they weren't protected by the same laws that governed their citizens. And so he says, count it all joy. Right? Knowing what you're walking through, knowing what you are called to endure, knowing what's going on, not just happiness, but, but with deep, abiding, hope-filled joy. C.S. Lewis says, I didn't go to religion to make me happy. I always knew a bottle of port would do that. If you want a religion to make you feel really comfortable, I certainly don't recommend Christianity. Can, James's call here and the call all over the Bible is not a call to happiness. It's a call to deep and abiding joy. And this is not my first response. And I'm guessing that for many of you, this isn't your first response either. Like hindsight, sure, you, you kind of look back over the landscape of the week or the month or the year and go, now I see what God was doing. Now I see that I should have responded in these ways. But this is not a call to simply grin and bear it, right? Just put on a smile and white knucklet and you can get through this. Fake it till you make it. No, this is, this is joy, deep, abiding joy in the hope of God, in the promises of God, in the character and the nature of God. Paul says in Romans 12, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Why? Because this isn't our natural tendency. This isn't our natural response. If it was, James wouldn't be leading off with that. Count it joy, my brothers. In other words, this isn't your natural tendency. But I'm going to press you in this direction anyways for your good, for God's glory to live this way. Why? Why count it all joy? Well, verse 3, 4 so that you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. For and that, this is the reason. James is not just saying, just do it because I said so. Do it because I have the authority to, to make you live how I, I want you to live. No, He's saying, live this way. Count it all joy when you meet these trials. For you know that the testing of your faith will move you in this direction. That you may be perfect, complete, lacking nothing. The goal of our trials is God's intended outcome. It means that there's a purpose behind all of it. Every single thing that we face in our lives. There's a... There's a a sovereign purpose behind all of that. And here we see that it's our perfection, our completeness, and our lacking in nothing. The aim of our testing is our perfection. It's not some kind of punishment. But this is so important for us to hear afresh again this morning. Because there, I think certain people, some of us kind of buy into this Christian karma idea of, well, I, I did this, and so now God's punishment in my life is this. If I would have only done this, if I would have woken up yesterday morning and just read my Bible like I should have, I wouldn't have gotten a flat tire. No, there's, there's no correlation there. there. There is no vindictiveness, no punishment behind these things. Right? And you can see that the loving hand of a father correcting and rebuking and loving us. But this is not punishment. This is for our good and for our perfection, as James writes here. Matthew 5, Jesus says, be perfect. Be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. So the call here to count it all joy Embedded in that, as we look at the end of verse 4, is this very concept of that our perfection and completeness, lack, completeness lacking nothing is the, is the end by which the vehicle that we're driving in of our trials and our afflictions and the things that we don't want, God is driving us toward this very thing. 
The very thing that he calls us to be. Be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Oh, by the way, the way that's going to happen is these trials that I'm going to bring into your life that that are going to move you in this direction if you allow them. The aim here is not our happiness, but our holiness. And over and over and over, if we, could, if we could just change the mindset of that very thing, that God is working for our holiness, not our happiness, that, that alone will give us the, the perspective and the lens to view with great joy all that God is doing in these trials. It is our holiness. Over the past number of months since we moved, we've been looking for rugs, right? We're trying to find something for the living room. We ordered one and it arrived. We cut it open, rolled it out, and 38 seconds later, my wife said, I don't like that. So we roll it back up, cover it, bring it back, send it back, look at rugs, go and try to figure out what's going to work. But it's amazing as you are, are rug shopping, and I know all of you, that's what's on the docket for this week, Right? We're going rugs. I'm glad you brought this up because that's what we're doing too. But as you look at rugs, the, the, the front side, they're beautiful. Some of these, and we weren't going to buy a Persian rug. You look at some of these Persian rugs, thousands and thousands of dollars. Craftsmanship and intentionality and just beauty. But you flip it over to the backside, it doesn't look that way. Right? It's, a, it's a mangled mess. There are knots everywhere. Right? It's just, it's not beautiful. It's not perfect. It's, it's a mess. And most of our lives, all we see are the knots. Right? The stray cords, the, the runs and the, the, the fabric. Nothing lines up. Nothing makes sense. It, it's a mess. And you flip it over. And that's what will happen in eternity when we flip over the rug and go, now I see what God was doing. But most of us, we, we, we fail to have this eternal perspective to our suffering, to our trials, that, that God is doing far more in every single one of those moments than we can possibly imagine. And like a beautiful Persian rug that on the, the bottom side is, is a knotted, mangled mess. And most of our lives, with no eternal perspective, feel that way too, if we're honest. A knotted, mangled mess. All we see is the knots. So how do we, if the call for us is to joyfully stand in trials, how? How do we do that? I'm glad you asked. Two things. First of all, notice the word brothers. Count it all joy, my brothers. Right? He's suffering, James is suffering right alongside of these people that he's writing to. And it is so important for us to be reminded that we do not suffer alone. That's the beauty of doing life together, locking arms together, running the race together, is that we don't suffer alone. We don't face these trials alone. We do it within the context of community. So count it all joy, my brothers. As you're suffering and walking through trials. That's why we pray the way we do in our services. By name. God, this is what's going on. We want to intercede and we want to love and we want to be in community with you as you're suffering. And for you to be in community as we are suffering. So that's the first thing. Is you're not alone. That's the first how. Of recognizing the importance of community as we face trials. Secondly, Everything is embedded in this term that that James uses that I said that we would come back to. James, a servant of God. A servant of God. This this word is dripping with gospel. But in order to unpack it, we have to to look beyond the cultural and the historical baggage associated with this term. Because the the word here is slave. Servant, bondservant, indentured servant. He's saying... I'm James. I'm writing to you. I'm a slave of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's important for us as we get to terms like this, that given historical context, given things that have happened, we have to push beyond that into the past and look at what what is the Bible meaning here? What is the original 
audience, the original intent of this word. It's not race-based. Many sold themselves into slavery. It was a means of them receiving provision, receiving protection. Uh, There was all of these these things that, that came. We had debt, and so we sold ourselves into slavery. And with that, we were provided for, we were protected, we had an identity. But with this term are also the, the idea of being purchased and owned by someone else, being redeemed at, at great cost. And as a servant, as a slave or a bond servant, three words that would have identified you, that identify us as servants of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ as James, our loyalty. So he, he purchased me. He redeemed me at great cost. Now I'm loyal to him. No matter the cost, I'm loyal to him. But with that is also authority. As a servant in a household, you're given the same authority as that person. And as believers in the gospel, we have the same authority today over those things as well because of our identity in Christ. And then lastly is humility. Humility. And you see that here with James, as I said already. James, the brother of Jesus, the leader in this church. But I'm a servant. I'm a servant. There is humility that comes. What's profound is in Isaiah 42 to 53, which kind of the, the servant songs, is where some of the most vivid and beautiful imagery about Jesus in the Old Testament is found, of Jesus being the suffering servant. It's the same word in Hebrew as it is in Greek here. That Jesus is the suffering servant. Right? So you fast forward to the garden. Jesus has been betrayed, getting ready to, uh, or they've had the, the, the last supper. He's getting ready to be betrayed. And now he's in this garden, begging God to find another way. And at the end of that says, not my will, but yours be done. As a servant, Jesus submitted to the authority of God. Romans chapter 6, Paul picks up this idea and runs with it and says, You who were once slaves of sin have been set free, and now you are slaves of righteousness. In other words, we belong to him. It means there's, there's nothing that cannot be demanded of us. And it, it's also means that there's nothing that we will face in our lives. Good, bad, indifferent. There is nothing that we'll face in our lives that Jesus is not already victorious over, that he has not conquered. Right? Hebrews 12, verse 2. Let us look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy, there's that same word, the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Right? He's not warring anymore. He's not raging against these powers and principalities. He's seated as a king who's returned from victory. Know that the the battle is done. He is seated. And so the how of how do we joyfully stand in trials, it's, it's looking at the gospel. It's seeing that we have been redeemed at great cost by Jesus coming as the suffering servant laying down his life for us seeing that the joy that was set before him secured our forgiveness. But we also are called to stand joyfully in the midst of turbulence, verses 5 to 11. Notice the end of verse 4, that the intended end of steadfastness is that you are perfect and complete, lacking in nothing, right? You have everything you need. And then verse 4 begins, if any of you lacks, sorry, verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, of which the the, the intent there is, by the way, you do. So verse 4, you're not going to lack anything. Oh, by the way, you do lack wisdom. So what do we do with that? So the, the command here is let him ask God. There's two times that this word is used, once in, uh, both in verse 5. I'm sorry, once in verse 5, once in verse 6. Let him ask. Ask God. This is a command in verse 6. But let him ask 
in faith. So twice we have the command of asking. So we're not going to lack anything, but now we lack wisdom, which means that in order for us to not lack anything, like verse 4 says, that the command now is to ask. Ask of God. Ask in faith. In other words, the perfection that we're called to, that steadfastness has as its end of perfection and completeness, completeness, perfection is only possible in our asking and receiving of wisdom from God. This is profound. Because it's not just hit cruise control and ta-da, you're there. It's you lack this, but you, you have everything you need, and the way that you get what you need here in verse 5 is by begging God to give it, asking. That's the command. Wisdom. So this idea of taking biblical knowledge and living in light of that, living with, with knowledge applied. And over and over in verses 6 to 8, we see that the wavering that comes, this turbulent time that comes, let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person, that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. So we are called to ask with unwavering faith. We are called to display our faith with single-minded, wholehearted devotion and obedience to what God has called us to do. And it's rooted in God's love. So in James 1.8 and then in James 4.8, James uses a word that he created. It's found nowhere else in the Bible, nowhere else in ancient Greek literature. It's, he is a double-minded man. And really it's double-souled, this idea of I have two different souls, one that lives this way here and one that lives this way here. And he's saying that in order for you to, to receive from God this wisdom that we need, in order to be perfect, you have to ask with single-minded, single-hearted, single-souled trust and obedience. Again, we're, we're coming to God as a father, and it says, ask, ask, and it will be generously given to you. This is profound. Because if we're honest, most of our prayers don't fit into this category. Kevin DeYoung says, our prayers fall into one of two categories usually. Either we ask that everything would be fine, or we ask to know that everything will be fine. And, and James is saying, no, no, no. Your call to pray twice here in this text is for wisdom. Wisdom, asking God to bestow upon you the knowledge and insight that you need in order to live in obedience to all that he's called you to do toward the end of this perfection that he requires of you. And this wisdom is the only way that you're going to attain the very thing that he's called you to do. In uh, First Sam, I think it's First Samuel 1, or maybe 2 Samuel 1, I forget. no, it's First Samuel 1, right? Solomon's getting ready to be given the throne, and God says, Solomon, ask. Whatever you ask, I'll give you. And Solomon says, God, I ask for wisdom to rule these people well. And God says, since you didn't ask for riches, I'm going to give you wisdom, and I'm going to give you all these riches and fame as well, because you asked for what was most important. And there's an incredible danger here. That's why James creates this word. He's double-minded, unstable in all his ways. There's an instability that comes, this turbulence that comes when you try to live duplicitly in two different ways, in two different categories, in two different worlds. Right? It's, it's impossible. I love watching spy movies. and right, you, you see from the outset somebody, here's what they're tasked to do and how they go about doing it. Um, but, but not so much when you, you look at documentaries of spies that have been in our uh, American government and selling secrets to the Russians or who, whomever it might be, right? You, you see that the duplicit, the duplicit nature of trying to live this way. I'm, I'm a federal agent tasked to protect and serve the Constitution, defend it against all enemies, foreign and domestic, until it comes to getting paid, then I'll sell these, you know, these trade secrets or 
these materials, these classified documents to the Russians. There's a great one on Netflix called The Assets, looking at Aldrich James. And you see that just the inner turmoil that he faces of, of this very thing, of living two different natures, two different minds, two different hearts. That's why it's profound that when, when Jesus is asked, what's the great commandment? Jesus says, love the Lord your God. Quoting Deuteronomy 6, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul and all your strength. In other words, don't try to live duplicitly. Don't have a d- double hearts. And you love God here and you love the world here. So we may hesitate to pray. I get that. We may hesitate to pray, but we ought not hesitate when we pray. The word unstable here at the end of verse 8 talks, is the same word kind of talking about the effects of a violent storm. And if you've lived this way, you know the, the, the danger of that, the double soul, the inner tur- turbulence and turmoil that's in your soul, that it begins to affect everything. And James says the very same thing. He's double-minded, unstable in all his ways. Everything that he does, there's instability, there's insecurity, there's turbulence. There is no steadfastness. This very thing that we're called to. Let, Let your life be tested so you allow your faith to produce steadfastness. And living duplicitly and double-mindedly is the very opposite of that. That it's, it's shifting around. There is nothing steadfast about it. There is no anchor tying you down. So in Hebrews 6, it talks about we have this hope as an anchor for our soul. Namely the gospel. That that's what tethers us in the midst of these storms. So we don't have to be double-minded and shifting from one allegiance to another. But why ask? So this is a call twice here is ask God and ask in faith. Why? Why ask? Because in verse 5, let him ask and it will be given. Let him ask God who gives generously. What's beautiful about that is this is present tense. It's not future tense. Someday this might happen. This is right now. In this moment, if you ask God for wisdom, this is saying that he gives it in this moment. Tomorrow, when you beg God for wisdom, in that moment, wisdom comes. It's present tense. He gives it right now. So James is saying, look, we can pursue the wisdom of this world. We can pursue the wisdom of those around us. Or we can pursue and ask the God of the universe for the wisdom that we need to live how he calls us to live. And God will meet that need in this moment. Because that's exactly what we need to do if verse 4 is true. Let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. That's only possible in our begging and asking of God. So how do we joyfully stand in turbulence? I would say that the same thing as I did a minute ago, that the fuel for joyfully standing in the midst of turbulence or just this, the waves that come is boasting in gospel hope. Look at verse 9 and the first half of verse 10. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation. And the rich in his humiliation. So what does that have to do with gospel hope? After, after being commanded to ask God twice, now the, another command in verse 9. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich boast in his humiliation. So both of these are founded upon the gospel. So Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 8, For you know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. 
So we, we see here just this amazing teeter-totter. I hated teeter-totters growing up. <laughs> right? I'd get on the end and somebody would get down to the ground and then just back off and you kind of fall and hit the ground. But what's amazing about this, on the, the heels of asking God for wisdom, is we see that the, the balance, the teeter-totter, the, the, the equality between these, that let the lowly brother boast. Those that have nothing. You boast in your exaltation that God has set his affections on you, that Jesus has come, become a servant, take, laid aside his riches in order that you might become rich in God's sight. So your exaltation in the gospel is that you have everything you need. Oh, and by the way, you rich, you boast in your humiliation because at the end of the day, your entrance into the kingdom, your joy and your satisfaction and your hope cannot be built in your stuff. No, it's in your humiliation, right? You seeing your spiritual bankruptcy and God loving you and sending a son for you. And so you, you see this, this equality happening in this moment, the teeter-totter that balances perfectly. So let the lowly brother boast. You boast in the fact that God has raised you up. And if you have everything you need, guess what? You don't. So you lay it aside. You recognize your poorness, your bankruptcy in spirit, and allow God through that humiliation to give you the very thing that you can't provide for yourself. So the fuel for standing in the midst of these turbulent times is to boast in the gospel. In poverty and in riches, fight to see the gospel. That's why this prayer falls where it does. You have count it joy. Steadfastness, producing perfection and completeness. You lack nothing, but you do lack wisdom. Pray for eyes to see that you need the gospel. That you can't sulk around in your brokenness and your lack of everything. And you can't boast in your uh, everything that you have. So you need wisdom to see that the gospel is the answer to everything that you need. Rejoice in the eternal love of God set upon you. Not the fleeting nature of riches and social status. Right? The world says, live here and buy this and wear that and drive this and acquire that. Then you'll be happy. Then you'll have everything that you need. Then you'll be content. You'll be joy filled. It's tragic to me how often you read of those that have made it to the top. And then they say, it doesn't matter whether we're talking sports or music or film. It doesn't matter. You make it to the top and realize that the absolute bankruptcy of it all. This is it? I've worked my entire life to get here because I was told that this is where ultimate satisfaction is. Now I've made it and realized there's nothing here. The fading nature of those things. Listen to the second half of verse 10 and verse 11. Because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Jeremiah 9 says, don't boast in your riches. Let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me. That's what our boast is. And that's the command here in verse 9. Boast in your exaltation. Boast in your humiliation that God has brought you up and given the, you the very thing that you need in his son. Lastly, we can joyfully stand in temptation. Verses 12 to 18. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. So blessedness, which is similar to happiness, but not the same. It's the same imagery, but, but blessedness, like joy, differs from happiness in that there is hope uh, driving it. So blessed is the man who remains steadfast. So the endurance of our faith uh, under trial, and that's, again, remaining steadfast is a present tense. It's ongoing. It's in the midst of moment by moment, day by day life. And the result here. In verse 12, 
But when he has stood the test, he'll receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. So the crown of life here is not talking about salvation. This is talking about the, the, the imagery here is running a race, getting to the end, and being given your prize. This is not run the race, and at the end we'll see how well you did. Do you get in or you, are you out? No, this is, you're in. Now live this way and run this race that's set before you with great joy so that at the end you receive this, this prize at the end. So stay the course. Something about receiving your prize in the midst of those that don't want you to win. Growing up, we lived for five years in Berlin, and while we were there, so we lived there while the wall came down, and we at one point visited the Olympic Stadium, 1936 Olympics, where Jesse Owens ran, and uh, in the midst of Hitler uh, kind of driving toward this kind of Aryan race, and no one can defeat my athletes, and you see Jesse Owens come out of the gate and just destroy them, and Hitler left. He didn't want to, to be there when the medals were given There's something about us receiving our prize at the end of this race amidst all of those that that don't want it. Colossians talks about our enemies being kind of uh, put under Christ's feet, them being kind of put to open shame. And I think this is part of that, of us receiving our prize, running this race with great joy and great endurance and being awarded a prize amidst the people, in front of people that, that want us to just fail. And again, the idea behind the word trial here means to prove the quality or worth of something through adversity. Is this genuine? Again, it's not a race to see if you're in or out. And there are a lot of world religions that say that. Just run this, do this, obey this, go these places, pray in this direction, and at the end we'll see if you're in. That's not what this is. This is a testing to prove the authenticity of what you believe. Is it real? Psalm 66, for you, O God, have tested us. You have tried us as silver is tried. But notice, and this is so important for us to see, there is a fine line between testing and temptation. Over and over and over, we see the trials that come and the testing that comes from God, and yet there's a fine line and a breakover point where God says, this is not on me. Let no one say, this is a command, do not say when you are tempted, I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with with, with evil, and he himself tempts no one. God never tempts. So we ought not look toward heaven with accusation, but toward the mirror. Trials are like a Trojan horse, right? So you remember this, this story? hide some soldiers and Silas, send you this gift, and then they come in and destroy everything. Well, it's kind of like hiding zucchini and chocolate chip cookies. Please don't do that. Um, right? Snuck it in. No, you didn't. <laughs> we know. Or the chili that you kind of make and you throw venison in it. Oh, it's, you'll never notice. Not my chili. You're like, no, you notice. But trials are that way. Trials are like a Trojan horse. There's a potential for temptation, an enticement towards sin embedded in every single one. Not sin on its own, but there's an enticement toward that. Tim Challey says, temptation is anything that promises satisfaction at the cost of obedience. So again, going back to what James said at the beginning, count it joy when you meet trials of various kinds. There's not one category He's talking about every single thing that you face, every testing, every trial embedded in that is a potential for you to sin. There's a potential there toward testing that that moves beyond that to to sin. Doesn't matter if we're talking about money or health, right? The inner turmoil, your unhappiness or depression, unmet expectations, or you look beyond yourself, you look at our, our world, you look at war and injustice and, and famine, or you kind of look at your, your own inner kind of motivational structure of success and popularity and being liked, whatever, whatever that is. Like, good things happen, and in the midst of that, there's a potential toward being tempted to sin. 
So one of mine is standing here and walking out that door and him. good job. Good job. There's nothing sinful about someone saying, good job, pastor. The sin comes later when I go, yeah, I'm pretty awesome, aren't I? Right? And pride wells up in my soul. Like, that's a very fine line and a danger for me. That's one of many. But every single thing that we're presented with, this testing that comes, the trials that come, there's an opportunity for sin embedded in those. So we don't point our finger at heaven and say, God, this is your fault. Verse 14, but each person is tempted when he's lured and enticed by his own desire. These are fishing terms. I'm not a fisherman. I I enjoy it. But this is cast in front of you. You see it. It flickers. looks kind of good. And you go for it, right? And you bite into it and you're enticed. And then what happens? Desire, when it's conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. These are beautiful pictures. Go back to the, the, the first one. Those are beautiful pictures, aren't they? Right, if I had a little box with these in there, the kids would be running up. Mom, can we, can we adopt one of these? Right, it's cute, it's furry, right? Beautiful, and they are beautiful. But what happens over time you take that home and you put it under your bed and every evening you throw a stake under there, right? Let it outside. And in a matter of a couple of weeks, couple of months, couple of years, it becomes this next picture, right? And then it's a little bit more difficult to manage, a little bit more difficult to control. Sin, excuse me, verse 15, desire when it is conceived gives birth to sin, And sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. So those pictures of the the beautiful little baby lions, they're awesome. Snuggly, let's hold it, right? But you fast forward a couple of years, you don't want to be hugging that thing, right? That's an apex predator. Like nothing hunts lions except people. Nothing hunts them. There's a reason for that, right? So there's a reason you can't go to the pet store and buy a baby lion, and bring it home, because people recognize very easily that it's a foolish idea. So don't secretly feed sin like a baby lion, pretending like it's okay, nobody knows. I'm always struck by it. So again, there was a a shooting on the news this morning, and the questions will come, and people, the, the reporters will go to their hometown and knock on neighbors' doors, and did you know Billy? And the response typically is, yeah, I didn't see that coming. I've known him my whole life. Never saw that coming. Why? Because of this text. Because of this verse. Because it's this slow process of feeding sin, nurturing sin, babying sin. In the the stages of infancy that you fast forward, it brings death. So you, the, the point of all of that is you have to kill sin early. You have to snuff it out in its stages of infancy. Don't feed it. Don't nurture it. Don't baby it. Don't pretend like this is going to be awesome. And you fast forward and you got a a full-grown lion living under your bed that wants to kill you. Right? That's what the Bible says. Our enemy is prowling around like a baby tiger. No, it doesn't. Our, Our enemy is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So kill it in its stages of infancy. Don't let it get full grown and bring forth death into your life. So endurance brings life. When he stood the test, I'll give him the crown of life. Or you can allow temptation to enter into your life and feed it and nurture it and baby it. And ultimately that sin will bring forth death. So do not be deceived. Verse 16, again, another command. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Very key that that comes there again. My brothers, you're not alone. Don't be deceived. What God does give you is everything good and perfect. Every good and perfect gift comes from above, coming down from the Father of lights. What's profound is that includes the trial That includes the testing that you walk through. Every good and perfect gift, including those times that you don't want, come down from our Father of lights. 
The, the language there, Father of Lights, means there's no shadow, there's no changing. God is steadfast, immovable, unchangeable. God gives good gifts. But most importantly, new birth from above by the word of truth, which is the gospel. Verse 18. Of his own will, he brought us forth. There's birth language. So contrast that against the coming forth of this sin in verse 15. God, of his own will, brought us forth, gave birth to us by the word of truth. That word is, that phrase is used all over the New Testament for the gospel. So God has given us life by the gospel that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So the how, again, very similar to the last ones, how we joyfully stand in temptation is by looking at the gospel. Verses 16 to 18, we fight temptation to sin by seeing the goodness of God in the gospel and the new life that he gives to us by faith. So we turn from our sin, we kill our sin, we look for ways to to fight the sinful patterns and behaviors in their stages of infancy and treasure Christ above all things. So our ability to stand with great, great joy whether we're talking about trials, we're talking about the tumultuous, uh, turbulent times of doubting and wavering, and we joyfully stand in the midst of temptation, namely by looking at the gospel and seeing God's love for us over and over and over in this As as a servant, as one that's been exalted, and then here brought forth, given birth by the gospel that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. I'm going to invite the worship team to come for our closing song and just invite you to, to, to listen to God as he speaks, even in this closing song, of what are the implications for you in this moment if this is true. Let's pray together. God, we need you. We need your grace to see that the call to stand with joy is only founded upon the gospel, not our own will and determination and white knuckling it on our own but in the midst of community with the brothers and sisters around us to see the love that you have and to fight with everything that we are and everything that we have for that great truth we pray in christ's name amen as i was listening i was thinking about this verse from psalm it's psalm 34 5 those who look to him are radiant with joy and their faces will never be ashamed We have the beautiful opportunity to come before God unashamed, and he welcomes us into his arms. So please stand as we worship and sing the last song.
For our benediction, 1 Peter 4, 12 and 13. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening. But rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Live this week in light of all that God has done and promises to do in you, through you, and for you. You dismissed. If we can serve you as elders with blue name tags, we'll be up front. Um, pray or just counsel you. Don't forget if you have kids in children's church to pick them up. They would <laughs> like that. Have a good week. See you soon.